Hello, everyone, and welcome to MSU FCU's Financial Education Seminar Series. We appreciate you all joining us and are excited to be here with you virtually. These presentations were created with you in mind, with the intention to give financial education on a number of relatable topics to help expand your knowledge of finances. Each event will be hosted by a member of our financial education department or one of our partners, connecting you with resources in our community. We have a number of diverse presentations planned for you this year, and you can explore and register for them by visiting us at MSU msufcu.org forward slash events. Today's event is being recorded. To rewatch or share the presentation, go to youtube.com forward slash msufcu, then select the msufcu seminar series from the playlist options. Recordings are usually available within about three weeks of the events. We will be pausing throughout today's presentation to address questions submitted to the Q&A. You may send your inquiries at any time during the event, which will later be answered in the order they were received. We will also provide additional information and resources in the chat, but please reserve the Q&A panel for your questions. I'm Therese Bacon, and I'll be your facilitator this afternoon. If you have any concerns or technology issues, I invite you to reach out to me in the chat. Again, questions for our presenters should be submitted to the Q&A. Today, we have an amazing guest joining us to present on dealing with difficult people. Allow me to introduce our host, Tom Hamp, who is a business transformation and leadership coach with Advi Coach. Welcome, Tom, and thank you so much for joining us. I'll pass it over to you so you can introduce yourself to our audience, tell us a little bit about your position with Advi Coach, and then we can lead right into our presentation this afternoon. Thanks, Therese. I appreciate you. Thanks for the well, uh, invitation back. We've done about two or three of these, and they've always worked out very, very well. Uh, as Therese said, my name is Tom Hamp. I am the owner and president of AdvoCoach of Mid-Michigan. And what we do is really help businesses uh, uh, improve to where they want to go. We talk with a lot of business owners finding gaps in their business. And what we're going to talk about today is one of those things we talk about with business owners, right? Um, trying to get their teams together, um, trying to create cohesion, trust, that type of thing. I'm starting my 14th year as a business coach, so this is not new to me. So Again, um, just happy to be here. And why don't we why don't we just get started? Um, I'll have both my contact information on this screen and then um, at the end of the presentation on the last screen if you don't get it. So again, as I said, Advocate Coach have been Michigan. Um, a number of uh, companies that I help out in the mid-Michigan area have been doing it for a little while. So let's talk about dealing with difficult people, right? So that means we're going to talk about the peers that we work with. We're going to talk about employees. Um, maybe maybe you're a manager and you have to deal with potentially you know difficult employees, and we'll define that a little bit later. And then also, if you're you know uh, an employee, how do you deal with difficult employees? That might be management. So we're going to talk about each one of these. So uh, and each one of them takes a little bit different uh, stance on how we go about you know um, discussing talking. Uh, dealing with difficult people going forward. So the first thing we have to do is define what difficult people are, right? And there's many different types, right? So let's kind of define them a little bit. So somebody that's that would be described as having, having callousness, right? So this behavior is unkind, cruel, without sympathy, those types of things. We may, may know some people that fit into that category. Uh, grandiosity, this is somebody that has a sense of specialness or self-importance that might, you know, lead you to um, not really appreciate them, that kind of stuff. Uh, and it's consistent. Um, aggressiveness, somebody that always seems to be, you know, always pushing over the top a little bit, that type of thing. Um, so again, another difficult type of uh, definition. Um, somebody that always is suspicious about stuff. They're not quite believing things that people say, whether it comes from management, their peers, that kind of stuff. So somebody that operates underneath that type of cloak. Um, somebody that's very manipulative, right? So serving or uh, intended to control or influence others, and maybe not always in the best way because manipulation isn't always technically a negative, but again, just seems that this person's always on the take on for something. Uh, somebody that's dominance, the quality of being more important, uh, strong or successful or thinking they are anyway. And then um, somebody that's a risk taker, right? That potentially puts their own, you know, well-being uh, on the line, but potentially could be putting other people's uh, well-being on the line right? as they're, you know, going about their day-to-day -day stuff as far as that goes. If I missed any, um, 
types of difficult people that are out there, please put it in the chat um, and let me know if we're missing anything. But for the most part, we're going to go with kind of this, you know, seven different d descriptions of difficult people going forward. So one of the things that when we deal with difficult people, we really have to kind of separate perception from reality. Is it, if it, is it us? Are we thinking that this person's difficult? Are they difficult for everybody? Or is the reality is that they really are difficult people, regardless of the person that that is dealing with them? So just a quick little graphic here mm -hmm. is that depending on your, you know, where you stand or where you are on a certain subject or where your mindset is, you could look at something completely different, right? So we really want to understand someone's perception versus the reality. So as we get into this, we kind of have to understand the biology uh, underneath that. And I know that may bore some of you to tears, but I just want to give you some background. So we're going to use the phrase behavioral analysis. And some of this might be familiar to you. Some of this might not be familiar to uh, some others. Um, but I want to kind of talk a little bit about what's going on here, right? So to better understand the concept of um, behavior styles, um, it's and this is in order to for, form those stronger relationships, to be more effective, to start creating trust, and, and at times in coaching and managing relationships, whether it's management above you, your peers that you work with, or even if you're a manager and you have employees uh, that report to you, okay? so. Again, we, we want to measure some of the outcome of some of this assessment. So we'll talk a little bit about that. What When we're talking about behavior analysis, what it's not, and a lot of people will jump to this pretty quickly, it's not a personality test. So it really describes behaviors that people exhibit. Okay, It's factual. It's not kind of made up of, hey, you're a certain kind of personality. So it's not a personality test. It's not about good or bad. So if you get rated a certain letter, we're gonna talk about the DISC profile, but if you get rated a certain letter, that's not a necessarily a good thing or a bad thing. It's just what it is. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, and then it's not psychiatry, right? So we're not, we're not putting you on the couch and not, not that that's a bad thing, but it's not psychiatry where we put you on a couch, that type of thing. So really, what we want to do is we're, we we take this uh, uh, assessment and it really me measures uh, observable behavior and emotions, and it helps us, what regardless of the position that we have inside a company, understand better the people that uh, we deal with, that we have relationships, that we're on teams with, that type of thing. So we call it a DISC profile. the The letters D, I, S, and C really have uh, connotations. It, it, they mean something, and I'll explain what those are. Um, and there's different types of uh, outcomes. So you might see a DISC profile in the circle gram here, but there's different ways that people see that. Early on, this was how they showed a DISC profile outcome. Then they kind of moved to this bar graph, and a lot of companies still do it that way today. And I am more favorable to this type of um Kind of representation of your results. Um, so what is, and and again, there's many companies that charge a lot of dollars for this. I will tell you, you can take your own DISC profile. Um, it's on the internet. It looks a lot like this. You can ask questions or excuse me, it, it asks you just to kind of look at each one of those different categories under each one of the letters and rate yourself into those, check which ones that you represent and then it has some instructions on how to rate yourself. And then down here, you can kind of rate yourself on where your each one of your letters DISC land. So it's pretty easy. But again, there's companies that really um, uh, have a lot of investment in this. They can come out. They can show you how to read these. They have reports. Uh, I do that as well. It's just one of those things that help in when when you're when you're dealing with teams and people that are on teams, that type of thing. So really the way it works is that the, the four letters are this. So if I'm in a classroom and not a, and, and we haven't done a disc, I'll ask the class to kind of stand up and maybe there's 20 people in the class. I'll ask them to stand up. Everybody that's outspoken and fast paced, front of the room. Everybody that's cautious and reflective, back of the room. 
right? So I separate those in two. And then the next step, if you're at the front of the room or the back of the room and you're questioning and skeptical, move to the right. I know we're looking at it upside down, but you move to the right. And if you're warm and accepting in those two groups, kind of move over to the left. And now I've got my four letters um, that I can start talking to them about um, and explaining how their behavioral analysis kind of um, reflects who they are. Is there any questions up to this point? I'll uh, pause here. Therese, anything that you have? Nothing yet. Okay. Thank you. Moving forward. So that being said, let's talk about the letters. So D is the dominance, um, dominance and that it's not necessarily a bad thing, but this is kind of their behavior, right? So some of the descriptors, they're daring, direct, persistent, self-starter. Their value to the team is their bottom line organizer, right? They're charging straight ahead. The, in their ideal environment, they want to be free, free of controls um, uh, and, and those types of things. Um, so again, they're, they're just different types of things that they, they exhibit as far as their behavior. Their tendency under stress it's interesting. So they start to get demanding, right? Aggressive, uh, even egotistical when they're under stress. So remember, we're trying to understand everybody. So, and, and everybody's not just one letter. They've got varying levels. So if somebody happens to be a higher D than everything else, these are some of the behaviors that they may exhibit, but they might be a high D and a high I. So some of that stuff you have to understand on how we do the disc profiling and that type of thing. Some of the li limitations they may have, maybe they set their standards too high. They lack tact and diplomacy. You've probably ran into people like that, that you know don't have a filter at times. And then potentially they could take on too much too soon, too fast. And their emotion when they get stressed is anger, okay? So that's the D. Let's move on to the I. And this is who I, I'm typically a high I. So um, of course I'm charming, uh, enthusiastic, persuasive, sociable, trusting, that kind of stuff. Um, value to the team, right? I'm a team player. I want to just be with everybody. I want to, I'm a people person. Try to want to make everybody get along. I negotiate conflict and that type of thing. Um, I, I, I want a high degree of people contacts. Uh, and you can see some of the other things there on the screen. My tendency under stress, um, overly optimistic. I might put goals way too far out there, um, get really talkative and potentially unrealistic with some of the things. My limitations sometimes, and if you could see my office here, inattentive to details, right? I'm not the most uh, neat person. Um, I trust people up front as opposed to making them earn it. And at times I can get distracted and I'm a so situational listener. So again, I really have to work on those types of things. Emotion for us as high eyes are really optimism, right? We, we tend to be more optimistic than, re than realistic. The S is really a steadiness, right? So these descriptors, good listener, patient, relaxed, team player, very understanding. Their value to the team makes certainly a lot of sense as they're dependable patient and empathetic, service-oriented, right? Um, they're the predictable, they, they demand a, certainly a predictable environment, um, they, they long-term relationships, those types of things. When they get stressed though, um, I, I, I like to describe it as a poker face, right? You have no idea. They're non-demonstrative, unconcerned, kind of tough to read. So they kind of go into a shell a little bit. And some of that limitation really is they will yield to others' ideas to avoid that controversy. So they'll sit back, even though they have totally disagree with the direction the group's going, to avoid that conflict. Um, and, and so with that, they certainly have di difficulty dealing with uh, diverse situations. And their emotion, as we talked about, is uh, not emotion. <laughs> and the last one is a C. I like to call this one the accountant um, uh, characteristic. It's compliance. These people are really all about the facts and the numbers, right? So they're analytical, fact finder, uh, precise. Those are some of the describing words for a C, high C. Um, value to the team. You need these people, right? They keep you straight. They, they keep you from making a lot of mistakes, right? They're very objective. They, they have an anchor in reality. Um, you know, this is where critical thinking is needed. This is what they do, um, technical work or specialized 
uh, specialization. So again, th this is where they live. So when they get stressed and you press back upon them, they get a little fussy, overly critical. And again, they feel that they've done all the research and work. So again, they, they, they know their stuff typically, right? So possible limitations, they do get defensive when criticized. You better come with all your facts, figures, and that type of thing. They get, certainly can get bogged down in the details. And they also, like the S, can appear somewhat aloof and cool, tough to read at times. Their emotion when they uh, emotion of a high, a high C really is fear going forward. So that's kind of a descriptor of all that stuff. So let's just quickly talk about what happens with the different DISC type of um, behaviors when they're bringing back a basketball, like maybe back to Meyer here in Michigan, if they're bringing that back to the store and they want to return for whatever reason. So a D might, you know, come up, hey, I bought this basketball and it's not the right thing or if there's a hole in it or there's a blemish in it and I need to return this right now. They're very direct, they're not happy and, and they kind of go at it like that. Where let's say an I might say, they might involve some chit chat first. Hey, how you doing? You know, um, you're at the end of your shift. Um, how's your day been? You know, all that kind of stuff. And then they might get to the reason they returned the basketball. Hey, I bought it as a gift. It didn't quite fit. It's a great product. But again, it's all about having that relationship, that discussion. Um, an S might come in, have the receipt and kind of sheepishly go, you know, I bought this. And if you could take it back, that'd be great. Here's my receipt. Is it possible to get, you know, a, a return refund for this a credit of some type? And then, of course, the C, they've got the receipts. They know your return policy. They've probably printed that out and brought it along with them and going to put it in front of you, that type of thing. So, again, just some different behaviors on how people react with those types of things. Another example, how we leave a voice message. A high D, very quick and short. Hi, this is Tom. Please leave the message. Please leave a message. Quick, short, sweet, that kind of thing. My voice message, if you <laughs> called me and I didn't answer the phone, hey, this is Tom. Thank you for calling me today. Um, please leave your name, number, and the reason that you called, and um, I'll get back to you as soon as I can, and have a great day, okay? The S, probably not as demonstrative as the D, kind of, hey, this is Tom. Um, thank you for calling. Can you, can you leave the reason why you called and give me a chance to research it, and I'll get back to you. Thank you. And then, of course, the C is, you know, name, um, that, that they're either in the office or out of the office. Please leave a message. Please leave the details so that I can get back to you um, either on an email or, or whatever the case is. So again, very factual as far as their their message uh, on, their, on their phone. And then maybe the, uh, so, th so those are two examples. Okay, so that being said, we went over the different types of characteristics and I'm sure your movie playing in your head is what your behavioral style is, right? So we want to try to have a mindset and understand what our behavioral um, style is. And it could be a combination. Maybe you're a high I uh, and D like I am. Maybe you're a high S and C or a high S and I. So again, it's best to understand what our, our behavioral um, style is. That way we can understand better what others are. So that being said, when we, when we talk about behavioral behaviors, it's not intention. Because in your head, you're thinking, you know what, Therese, she's, she just doesn't like me. She always treats me this way or that way. But Therese, you might not even be on Teresa's radar. She's, that's just who she is, right? So sometimes we put things in, the, in play that aren't even close. So Behavioral styles are not intention. It's just who we are. And sometimes we have to understand what's going on so that we can move on and really start potentially going down a different road and having a different relationships with potentially those difficult people, or at least who we thought were difficult people. So that being said, if you know your style, your responsibility is to adapt at least some. I'm not certainly not telling anybody to change, um, wholesale changes. But if you understand who you are, the type of style you have, you can better understand other people and you can adapt a little bit to their style maybe. So if you're if you're a high S and you're talking or going to have a, a meeting with a high D, maybe you 
cut down some of your results into more uh, smaller, shorter statements, that type of thing. Okay. So again, it's how we all start to react in our uh, relationships. So adapting, right? Just like this, you know, this dead stump. It's adapting, right? New growth out of the top. That's what we need to do. We have to understand where we are and then move in a different direction based on what's around us. So one of the things we say, and, and this is where really we single out the S, is what we try to make an S of ourselves. So if I'm a D or I'm an I or I'm a C, I do want to become more of an S, right? Because if you look back at those descriptors, they're pretty good listeners. They're relaxed. They're almost non-emotional. And we want to make sure that we're understanding the different styles of other people. So if we can make more of an S of ourselves um, when we're having conversations and relationships with others, that will help bring them out. Now, again, they bear some responsibility, but they may not know. Remember, it's not intention. Uh, they may not know their styles. So if we can become more of an S, we can really facilitate the conversations, facilitate the relationships that type of thing. Any questions up to this point? Know this a lot of information. Nothing there? No, okay. no, no questions yet. We'll, but yeah, okay. yeah I think we'll it's really, you. yeah, I think this is really great information though, just kind of recognizing these tendencies in yourself <laughs> and now sure. being able to apply them to people around you. Yeah, I think it's very helpful. So yes, go on. Okay. <laughs> So when we adapt, and I'll just go over some of these quickly. So if you're a high, you know, it, whoever you are, whether you're D or you're the, the other le letter characteristics, if you're talking with a D or if you're trying to adapt to the D, you, you already know they like to be, um, sorry about that, um, they like to be direct, straightforward, and open, right? So we should try to communicate like that, right? Communicate briefly. Um, let them take the lead. Be clear of the expectations, stick to the script, all that kind of stuff, and be ready that they're going to be blunt, demanding. Uh, they may have a lack of sensitivity and, and maybe not a lot of the, you know, the chit chat, social, social interaction. But again, we know that we can handle that better than not knowing that. And what they, what they want from you um, really could be power and authority, a promotion, depending on where you are, as far as your position, prestige, B, uh, big challenges, authority, and that kind of stuff, results, direct answers going forward. Uh, adapting to an I, right? So I, eyes like myself, like others to be friendly, emotionally honest, and recognize the eyes, eyes for our contributions. So again, we like that small talk. Maybe it's not always all business, right? Let them, let them know how, uh, let them tell you how they feel, how we feel right? Provide written details. Um, be ready for our attempts to persuade or influence, overselling some ideas, um, those types of things. Again, so again, that's that's just understanding how eyes tick going forward. Um, may want from you visible rewards, public recognition, warm, casual, warm relationships, that type of thing. How do we adapt to an S? Again, they like to be relaxed, agreeable, and cooperative, right? And to show appreciation. So, be logical, systematic, show them how, how, show them they are important. Let them go slow into change for sure. Um, be ready for that friendly approach, but not overbearing like an eye. Difficulty prioritizing sometimes and difficulty with deadlines. What they may want from you, status quo, private appreciation. They don't want a lot of attention. So you may have to recognize them on a one-on-one. -on -one. They want to follow your standard procedures time to adjust to changes in sincerity. And then of course, the adapt to a C, they're not very sociable, right? Minimize social, give details, accuracy, that kind of stuff, give clear expectations, uh, be tactful, uh, honor precision, those types of things. They get very uncomfortable with people that just fly by the seat of their pants. And, and I, I certainly can understand why now by understanding how a C style operates. Uh, they have the desire to double check, even though you may have just poured your heart into something. Uh, they don't mean this, but they may ask you to double check those types of things because they're just trying to be um, thorough. And then the, what they may want, clear expectations, limited exposure. Again, not a big uh, uh, attention seeker, references and verification, uh, verification uh, attention to their objectives. So again, that's how we try to adapt 
moving forward with the different styles. And again, if you know the styles and you now know DISC, and you can probably maneuver a little bit better in your relationships with people around the office. The big thing with all this is really distrust and, and trust, right? So if there's not trust there, then there could be all kinds of issues. And so we're gonna talk about a thing, a, of where this comes from, right? Trust is not just the absence of distrust, really, um, and we're going to get a little bio biological here, is that they actually take part in different parts of the brain. So if we, we trust somebody, that's different than when we distrust somebody, right? So just real quick here, trust comes from the prefrontal cortex. There's something that about that that maintains that relationship and that type of thing, where if we're talking about distrust, it comes from the what they call the reptile or the old part of the brain, which is called the amygdala. And it's down here, right? And this is the fight or flight area of the brain. Fight, fright, flight, or freeze. Um, and so it could be as simple as something like this. I'm talking with Therese. She's something, she says something that I might has felt that is insulting. She didn't mean it, but I felt that it was insulting. And all of a sudden, I've got this anger or this, this heightened sense of, She's trying to attack me somehow. And all of a sudden I'm not thinking clear and I'm not rationalizing and I'm going back to my desk and I'm gonna chew on this for a while and look for reasons why she said that. So that amygdala happens to everybody. We can't stop it. What we can do though, is we can do a better job of, okay, maybe she didn't mean that. Maybe it, it has nothing to do with me and I need to get my emotional legs back underneath me. Because again, we can't stop it, but we can recover from it. And di different people have different ways to coping and, and uh, coming up with it. We call that an amygdala hijack. And again, it can happen as in the middle of a big meeting to where a, a, a speaker in front of the room says something. And all of a sudden, you're mad. In the middle of a meeting, you're no longer taking notes. You're not taking, listening anymore. And you've completely shut down. So how do we how do we stop doing some like so, some things like this? And we really can't, but we have to start understanding behavior styles that the world doesn't revolve around us, and that that person may have not met anything even remotely connected to you at all. But try to keep the open lines of communication open, listening not to respond, but listening to collaborate. Those types of things. So as you see, as we've went through these ex explanations ahead of time is that we've started with you. We haven't started with the person that's difficult. We've started with you. And are we doing everything possible to make sure that it's we're not putting things in place that aren't really there? So moving on from there. So again, I, this is just kind of review. It happens to everyone. Now what do we do? Get Take that deep breath and get your emotions right back in order so that we can continue on. And it's hard. It's hard when we first start dealing with this. Um, and you see people that can carry some of this hijack for days. We need to get out of that, right? So again, we'll give you some tools to try to do that. We also want to understand what's the difference between an outburst and conflict. An outburst, I think a lot of people are familiar with that, right? Is that outburst, these are something that just happen very, very infrequently. It's not this ongoing conflict. So I don't necessarily classify that as a difficult person. Um, Outbursts happen when somebody certainly de decides to behave inappropriately, right? Um, um, but not every outburst is a conflict. Outbursts certainly not acceptable, shouldn't, shouldn't be overlooked, uh, regardless of the attempts to justify them. That's just not the place in business, right? Not the place anywhere, but it's certainly not very, very professional. Um, and then, um, oops, sorry about that. Um, who's responsible um, in the cause? Often the problem is temporary and easily resolved. So it's, there shouldn't be any any um, disagreements about those types of things. Can we agree that outbursts tend to be um, amygdala hijacks, maybe an overblown hijack, and certainly not the issue here. And then true conflict is just this ongoing um, kind of conflict between people, right? Could be people who regularly seem to avoid each other, com continuous complaints, frequent and heated, uh, and, and they tend to be disruptive, right? And then there's certainly many other situations that you guys have probably run into. Um, there's two really key um, keys to being successful at resolving conflict. And really, it's about being assertive and the art of negotiation. And it's really about talking to that other person, right? So being assertive is all about 
you know, expressing your ideas um, and actions um, and opinions with confidence, making sure that we're doing some of that kind of stuff. Um, it, it matters, right? We have to be assertive with these types of things. Avoid being passive, aggressive. Again, that contributes to that conflict. And then um, be willing to negotiate. So when we do have these conversations, we want to try to find the solution the parties involved with will be satisfied with. So that means that if you feel there's a difficult person, there's a there's a one-on-one -on -one meeting between you two that's coming up. Because how else are we going to solve this? We can turn our head and look the other way, but probably not the best idea as far as that goes. So we have to listen to what others have to say. Questions, comments here? Nope, we can keep moving forward. Perfect. So here's some tools, difficult, difficult people that are peers. What are some of the things and the takeaways for here? So with peers, um, surely stay calm. Think may, maybe there's some conflict. Maybe it's some type of amygdala hijack that's happening a, for a long time. So have that conversation. Hey, did I say or do anything that caused you some strife? Get some stuff out on the table understand their perspective. Possibly it's a disc issue, right? It's this is their behavior. And maybe you're making something that isn't there. You think they're a difficult person and they're really not. They're, they're Your guys are just having some communication or relationship type of um, dis, um, not just disagreements, but a misunderstanding, that type of thing. Certainly we want communication to be clear. Uh, we want to listen actively when we're talking and having these conversations. Uh, but if it's, if there is something there, we certainly have to set boundaries so something doesn't get out of hand. So we need to be cognizant of that. If it gets too far along, maybe we bring in a third party. If it's a manager or HR or that type of thing, we don't want it to get too far out of hand. And then focus on the solution because in these conversations, things can go down many rabbit holes. So we want to try to always bring it back to what, what's on hand. And then if, if it really gets out of proportion, you may have to document. And I'm sorry to say that, but sometimes it, it can get out of hand that, that way. And then some of the other stuff, certainly stay professional. You're not trying to get in an argument. Uh, know when to escalate it if it gets out of hand. And you certainly have to take care of yourself. And that's where the setting the boundaries and that type of thing comes into play. Anything else? Uh, any questions uh, with peers that have come forward yet? Nothing yet. Okay. Let's talk about fellow, uh, if you're a manager and you have employees that report to you, totally different set of rules here, right? So I shouldn't say total, uh, totally different set. There are some similarities, but there's also some um, differences as well, right? So with employees, we need to address the behavior promptly. What is going on? It could be a possibility of a disc. So if you've not had that analysis done, maybe we need to you know, go down that road. Um, certainly get into a private conversation. What's going on? Was there something said? Was there an event that happened? Is there, you know, is there something else going on? That type of thing. Again, part of it is listening actively, give them your attention so they understand that, you know, you really are invested in what they have to say. Um, but we also want to set clear expectations. I know that things can like this can happen, but there could be a situation that it can only be tolerated once or twice, depending on your um, employee handbook. And it depends on the severity of some of this stuff. If it's getting in the way of work product, okay, we need to make sure that we're setting these clear expectations or resetting them. Because if you've done a good job of setting the expect expectations already in some type of uh, position description, employee evaluation, those types of things, we may need to reset those to make sure they understand that. Offer support. You know, is there something that you're going through right now that I can, you know, help you with or that we can help you with or offer anything um, if your company has some something that you refer psychological help or any type of support like that? Again, offer those types of things if that they're at your disposal. Certainly document this type of discussion from manager to employee type of thing because you just don't know where it's going to go. Um so we certainly, um, we want to provide that feedback, right? We want to make sure that we're staying on top. It's not a one-time deal. Um, as we send them out, we want to make sure we want to provide that feedback for them so that we understand what's happening. Um, if there's, if, 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 if people have stepped over boundaries, we may need to implement consequences for that. So again, these types of things need to take place 
in this type of manager employee type of relationship when the manager is noticing some conflict or some difficult people that they need to deal with. Some of the other things that you may have to uh, step into, and that is you may need to uh, HR, you may, may, may need to involve HR, but that's only if necessary. Certainly if it's, you know, if it's on a certain level, but if you feel that it's escalating and there doesn't seem to be a solution, then maybe you need to involve HR. But once you do that, obviously things start to change. Uh, you want to monitor that progress, right? Are things getting better? You're documenting the initial uh, meeting, the solutions, all that kind of stuff. And you want to check back into them every week or so to make sure we're going in the right direction. Oops, went too fast on that one. Sorry about that. And then um, know, know when to let it go, right? So if, if it gets out of hand, either escalate it or maybe it's not that as big a deal, but we want to make sure that we've got that negotiation down and moving forward, going forward. Questions here. Okay, home stretch. Now, this is the most difficult one because now we might feel we have a difficult manager, right? Or management. So this is a little, this is some different set of rules because we can't go in with guns a blazing on this because you know there's a different relationship here. So when we're talking about management, um, again, talk about yourself first, right? Maybe that manager just had one of those outbursts that amygdala hijacked, they did or said something that wasn't appropriate. Now, again, I'm not excusing it, but I'm saying, is this a is this a difficult person that we have um, dealings with and this is happening all the time or is this a one-time deal? So make sure that you understand that. Understand their perspective. Again, what type of disc style or behavior style are they? So we can understand that before we potentially have that one-on-one -on -one meeting. Um, so when we decide to have that meeting with a supervisor, we need to choose the right time and place, right? So set that up ahead of time, making sure that you um, that you have everything together, prepare and that type of thing, because this can be sensitive. Um, but I think, again, if it's a long ongoing situation, we need to clear the air. Uh, pre so prepare your points, making sure you've done that research with that. Um, so the communication, right? Um, respectively, obviously try very, very delicate in, in this dynamic is to keep really the emotion out of it as much as you can, right? No raising of voices, but communicate respective, uh, respectively your points. Um, the arguments that you have as far as that stuff goes, I think it makes for a much better place on the communication. Focus on the solutions, right? Again, can go down rabbit holes. We want to um, you know, come up with the solutions and how what's going on, especially if the manager may not even realize they're doing it. So just explain that. Focus on how it can be handled maybe different in the future. And I'm, and by the way, I'm not saying this is super easy to do, um, but I've counseled and coached people on how to do this uh, in certain different areas. So we want to seek clarifications too uh, about what's been going, you know, what's going on. Maybe there is um, some, some things that you may have missed, but just get the full story. And then you actually have to document your concerns as well, because again, if it's something that turns out to be more serious than at first thought, then it's better to have some documentation on your side on that. Some of the other points with that, um, request feedback. So again, it might be on you. And I certainly was an employee in a company that I walked into my manager's uh, office and said, um, I'd like to do a performance evaluation. When can we set that up? I mean, they just weren't into doing that kind of stuff, but I wanted to know where you know, where I stood, how was, how was I doing uh, compared to uh, expectations? So sometimes, uh, depending on the company, you may have to do that type of thing. And you may need to seek support if necessary. One of those uh, alternatives could be HR, um, but again, making sure that you're taking care of yourself as well, right? And then know your rights and go right back to your employee handbook, understand what's going on. And it certainly depends on the severity going forward um, with that. And then consider your options. It, there could be a situation to where maybe maybe it's a situation where you have to leave that particular company. Again, I'm I'm wishing that you would go through and make sure you're doing you know the the right things, having the conversations, getting support, um, know your rights. But 
ultimately it may come up to a point where you may have to make some major decisions with that because of this difficult person. If we've tried everything that we can, we've elicited help, uh, and that doesn't seem to be solving anything, and, and there doesn't seem to be any, any end in sight, part of that self-care is really looking out for your future and making different decisions going forward. Hopefully it doesn't come to that. That concludes what I got. Any questions out there at all, Therese? We haven't had any come through yet, but sure. um, but yeah, that was really great information there. And then once again, there's Tom's um, contact information if you do want to reach out to him directly um, with any further questions on this subject or any other resources that he might have for you. So thank you again for that presentation, Tom. I just think it's so important to keep these things in the forefront. I, I think, you know, it's like we we learn this throughout working for different employers or if you're running your own business, you take these classes. Um, but then sometimes it kind of just falls to the back of your mind and you're not sure. keeping these things on the forefront when you're dealing with your employees or customers or any, you know, colleagues. So um, um, so yeah, I think that's just great information to kind of refresh us all on, on kind of dealing with, with you know, different types of people and, and the best ways to do that. So, so once again, the recording from today's event will be posted to our YouTube channel within our seminar series playlist and should be available within a few weeks of today's date. Um, and then I invite you to also take the survey that will open um, as you close out the Zoom um, to get your feedback on future presentations. Um, our next webinar is Growing Your Savings with MSU FCU, and that's actually tomorrow, March 6th at 6 p.m. And if you're in the Greater Lansing area, we invite you to visit our Farm Lane branch to learn about three transitions to retirement hosted by our fin financial solutions partners, LPL Financial. Um, and that's Thursday, March 7th at 6 p.m. at the Farm Lane Community Room. So with that, we're going to go ahead and stop recording and address any other questions submitted to the Q&A. Um, thank you all for being here this evening.